is. That sounds pretty good. I'll have to, I'll have to write something. Hi kids, CB Coil here. Uh, webcasting to the Facebooks from Mighty Fine Guitars in Lafayette, California. Nice to see you. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, let me, uh, in fact, let me just send something right over to myself here uh, and send this out to the personal page as well because you know you're just, you're just not an acoustic musician unless you have all this electronic crap going on. Uh, my guitars, there's the thing. Let's share that with share no public. Good. All right. My God, that guy has gray hair. When did that happen? Too many products in there. Today, it's, uh, I think today is going to be, how's the sound, by the way? Do let me know, and do let us know where, well, us. I'm using the royal we, which, uh, um, do let us know where you're, you're, you're typing in from. It's going to be New Guitars Day today. It's not, not brand new guitars necessarily, although some of them are. Guitars that are new to the shop, and I tell you, I've got the best job in the world. People walk in the door and say, here, sell this fabulous guitar for me. Tony Vine's guitar here. Look at this thing. This is Pau Ferro. And uh, in fact, I got so new I got to use my cheat sheet. Excuse me. Uh, Tony Vine's Artisan Guitar, number 75, from 2004. It's uh, Pau Ferro, back and sides, and Western Cedar, uh, Red Cedar top. Abalone Rosette, cutaway, maple binding, string spacing at the nose, one and three quarters, string spacing at the saddles, two and a quarter. And it's long scale, 25.7. So kind of good for uh, drop tunings, I think. Let's give it a spin, see what it sounds like. Give you a look at the thing. Really nice. I'm not familiar with this builder. He's uh, been building in, in Nashville for 30 odd years. And uh, one of those builders that doesn't build a lot, but he builds really good. So his guitars, it's taken a while for them to drift this side of the Rockies. So Tony Vines, there's another Tony Vines coming back and it's out on a sleepover right now which may uh, appear right during our webcast here, and if it is, if it does, I'll play it for you. Pau Ferro back and sides, and Western Red Cedar top. Beautiful, beautiful. Typically for finger style, I find myself really digging a combination of a hard back and side wood with a softer top. It kind of does everything that way. You get some of the ping, you get some of the punch of hard back and sides, but you get some of that slightly, very slightly attenuated high end. It's not got that sprucey kind of really really hard ping sound sort of to it. Oh, how's that? The angle is better. Folks, helping out today as always is uh, Shigor, Mistress of the Machines, my own dear Valerie May. Thank you very much. And how's the angle now? Can we see in the, in the camera? Okay, very good. Cool. There you go. Let's see what it sounds like, because that counts too when you're talking about guitars. Vines. And this one's called the Artisan. Pau Ferro back and sides, uh, Western Cedar top. Really nice. I'll play that same piece on a different guitar. Hang with me for just a second. There's a gentleman by the name of Kevin Corcoran who owned, I'm shouting, I realize, who owned a shop in uh, 
down in Gilroy, California, a few years ago, called the Gilroy Guitar Gallery. And it was a great shop, and he was building the whole time he ran the shop. And uh, man, oh man, his building has just gotten to be stratospheric. Wonderful builder. I wish you could... Uh, can you see? The, the fingerboard extension is not pasted down on the top. He floats it, kind of like the way they do... I said, he floats it like the way they do on jazz guitars. And uh, the idea being that there is sound to be gotten out of the upper bout here, uh, rather than kind of the Martin uh, standard, which was, well, you know, most of the sound is coming out of here. Let's just paste the fingerboard down and run a big brace across the, the front of the, uh, uh, under the, uh, the upper bout. Make the angle so we can see under there. Can you see under there? It's just a little tiny space. Just a little tiny space. But fact is, this fingerboard is floating above the guitar itself, which not only... Presumably, and I think it does, frees up the top to, f to vibrate in ways it wouldn't otherwise if, if the fingerboard extension was pasted down. But it also uh, makes for vastly easier neck adjustments. Every guitar, after 20, 25 years, every steel string guitar is probably going to need a neck reset. You know, there's only so much you can do with, uh, with uh, truss rods. Yeah, a bit more of that sprucey kind of sound here. This one is a uh, spruce top with um, really beautiful figured mahogany, probably from the bottom part of the tree where all these compression lines are showing up. So this is, uh, folks uh, sometimes think, uh, you know, that there's mahogany and then there's mahogany. There's regular old mahogany, there's really straight grain and whatnot, but this stuff that's down at the bottom of big trees, the thought is, might be a bit more dense. It might have a bit more of the sonic characteristic of rosewood instead of just straight ahead, kind of middle of the road mahogany. Sonically, mahogany is thought to have uh, sort of um, a bit of attenuation in the bass end and in the treble end, but really strong in the mid-range, whereas rosewood kind of has a bit more on each end. I don't know. When you get uh, mahogany this dense, dense, I'd love to. This is, uh, this is kind of a remarkable sort of sound because I'm, I'm feeling, I'm seeing certainly ma mahogany, but I'm hearing kind of rosewoodiness. Play that same piece. Corcoran. This one is uh, a double O size, <clears throat> about the size across the lower bout and in the depth of a, um, of a classical guitar. Oh, and something I should have mentioned on the Tony Vines guitar before. In fact, I'll pull them up next to each other and start to take a look. The depth of a Tony Vines guitar is, uh, is uh, greater than you'd expect out of a guitar this size. It's not exactly a Nick Lucas. Uh, but this, the same idea, a fairly small body, certainly not a dreadnought body, but with extra depth so that you have more air volume inside the guitar, providing sound. And there's ways and there's ways. Completely different uh, idea builds, build ideas rather, but both very successful, wonderful guitars. Tony Vines, Kevin Corcoran, and uh, a fellow named John Datlin has been building guitars up in, uh, we had him on the, uh, on the show. <laughs> We had him on the show, ladies and gentlemen. We had him on the webcast uh, a few weeks ago. A wonderful builder named John Datlin out of American Canyon just stepped away here. And I'll play a brand new one he brought in. Kind of a very uh, traditional OM kind of guitar. OMs and triple O's are designations, are Martin designations, and even lots and lots of non-Martin guitar builders use the Martin designations just because they're very handy. <coughs> triple O's and OMs are the same 
dimensions outside the guitar. The distinction is, typically, although there are variations of each and going both ways, what the hell did I just say? Uh, an OM has long scale, the, the actual string length is longer than a triple O, and the fingerboard is wider, but the body size is just the same, and this is very much a traditional kind of Martini triple O, uh, OM rather, with the long scale and the wide fingerboard. Now why would you want a long scale or a short scale? The, the rule of thumb used to be long scale Martin guitars, because most of them were. You'd want long scale for folk or bluegrass, because you can hit the strings harder and they don't rattle as much, is what it kind of boils down to. And uh, short scale, Gibson guitars were mostly short scale for blues and rock kind of feel, and uh, uh, folk rock, because you could push the strings around easier. Short scale means you can push the strings around easier. Long scale means that the strings don't wobble as much, is kind of you know what it boils down to. This is a wonderful day, and this one, smells really good. John does oil varnish finish instead of a nitro, nitrocellulose lacquer finish, which is what most people do with their guitars, both of these, uh, the Tony Vines and the, and the uh, Kevin Corcoran. This one is oil varnish, and it smells great. You can smell all the wood that's involved here. Again, Pau Ferro, and a spruce top. Three guitars that just walked in the door. I sit here, I do my email, I occasionally indulge in some political rhetoric on Facebook, and people walk in the door with guitars for me to sell for them. Now these two are direct from the builders, the, uh, the, the Corcoran and the Datlin, and the Tony Vines is from a uh, civilian, you know, collector that, uh, you know, has other guitars at home that he likes better than this one. Can you imagine that? Just quite remarkable. And I just never know what people are going to want or what's going to sell. There was a Martin, uh, a 1937 Martin D18 that was here for a couple of years. And it was a player guitar. It's what they call a player guitar rather than a collector guitar. A player guitar in that it played great. It's a 1937 D18 and it played every bit like a 1937 D18. It had been rather inelegantly finished refinished back in the uh, in the 1960s but boy oh boy it was a player not a collector and finally somebody came in and said yeah that's the guitar for me you just never know this is uh, this goes back to my feeling from uh, when I was uh, a kid and looking back over my career of having owned you know several guitars I never should have sold any of them that's you know that's the thing you just never know what's going to be of interest to somebody and what's going to become popular I had uh, my brother and I started off with a little plastic m and &E toy guitar that had a little plastic box that clamped onto the fingerboard with rubber bands, and you'd press the buttons to play the chords. You'd just kind of press buttons over here and strum over here. And I saw that on YouTube or eBay or one of those places for sale in the box. I think it was probably seven or eight dollar item back in the early 60s. $1,500 was the starting bid. That was the reserve. It was on eBay. That was the reserve on eBay. Never sell anything. What am I saying? Uh, except here. 
bring things in here that you want sold because uh, this is kind of where the creatures meet to find really good stuff. Have a look at the website. The website's getting a big update. There's all kinds of new stuff going up there. Uh, stay tuned these next couple of days. MightyFineGuitars.com, of course. Uh, do we have any questions from the, the assembled? Nothing yet? All right. <laughs> They're just in awe and enjoy it. <laughs> of course they are.
Hello, Ken. Hello, Jennifer. Hello, Cubby and Annette and Darlene. Hello, all. Nice to see you. If you've just tuned in, <laughs> thank you very much. If you've just tuned in, we're checking out three new guitars that came into the shop that walked in the door today while I sat there doing my thing. Uh, play a little bit more on the on the Kevin Corker, and that was the John Datlin. This is a double O. I'm kind of a double O fan myself. Uh, my alpha guitar is by a gentleman named Alan Perlman. It's essentially the size of a double O, which is about the size of a classical guitar. But just a, a lovely, comfortable size. Uh, a lot of folks are coming in saying, you know, the old dreadnought that I played in college kind of doesn't fit me anymore. I have shoulder impingements from too much tennis or hammering or something. And trying to wrap around that big old dreadnought just doesn't work, especially when I'm sitting on a couch which is where most of my guitar playing gets done. So something to consider is a sofa sweetheart, like this, a little double O. You don't have to sacrifice sound. Listen to that big and full and rich and lots of bass. We'll just come through the microphone here. How is the sound, by the way? Jennifer, Ken, hit me. How's it sounding out there? It's ones and zeros. What could go wrong, folks? Well, yeah. Yeah, like Tony Vines. Or... So there you are, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, any questions, comments? Yeah. 
good. Everyone's very happy. Everyone's very happy? Good, good. <laughs> that's, that's all we want, is a little respite from all that other stuff. So thanks for tuning in. Um, we've got a show coming up next month. Uh, middle of next month is Ed Gerhardt. This is going to be one of those shows where we're going to ask for an RSVP. So if you would like to see the Ed Gerhardt show, which will probably not be webcast, it would be just uh, cast to live cast to uh, folks here at the, at the shop. And that's, I believe, the 15th of next month. Uh, that's going to be an RSVP show. So do RSVP to me if you're local and want to come see Ed Gerhardt at Mighty Fine Guitars. Uh, shoot me a little note at stevie at mightyfineguitars.com, and I'll put you on the list. I'll put you on the big list. And uh, once again, to review, Tony Vines, Kevin Corcoran, and John Datlin were featured today. And I'll, I'll uh, go back and change the title of this video so everybody knows what was sort of what happened. And it's your old pal Stevie Coyle signing off. Thanks very much to uh, Shigor, Mistress of the Machines, and uh, see you down the road.